Okay, um, so I think we're uh, about ready to go. There's still one or two people uh, entering the waiting room, but, but um, we'll admit those as, as, as they come. Um, so uh, um, I'll just briefly uh, position what we're doing here. Um, on the 26th of February, 2021, the UK Home Office launched a public consultation to consider how legislation can be used to enhance the protection of publicly accessible locations across the UK from terrorist attacks and to ensure widespread organizational preparedness. This is an 18-week consultation which seeks views from all parties and stakeholders that are protect duty will potential effect. So Paul Ree here have, have convened a, 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 an assembly um, between um, insurer members of Paul Ree, non-members of Paul Ree and the wider insurance uh, uh, industry and, and the Home Office who are charged with uh, um, drawing up the legislation. So I'll hand over now to Julian Enoichi, who's the CEO of um, Paul Paul Ree, to, uh, uh, to uh, give us a brief introduction. Thanks, Steve, and, and apologies if my voice gives up halfway through, but I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes, so hopefully it'll, it'll uh, bear up. But good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us and for um, the opportunity to hear about an issue that I think is going to be extremely important. Uh, in the coming years, and you're going to hear from some really experienced people to tell you about that. Puri, as you know, is a disaster risk financing mechanism, and um, as such, it's structured as a public-private partnership, and we value our partnership with government colleagues and are particularly pleased, therefore, uh, to work with them in hosting today's event, because I think it's extremely important, as I've said. Um, Puri's key mission, if you like, is education and awareness around terrorism issues, uh, so that we can, by doing that, ensure a greater understanding of uh, the terrorism risk. And I'll explain the reasons for that in a second. But it's also to act as a conduit for cascading Her Majesty's government messages through our industry. Um, and this builds on the collaboration that we have had now for some years with the, ho <coughs> with the Home Office, excuse me, and particularly the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, as well as the Metropolitan Police. And I'm pleased, therefore, that Sean Hipgrave has agreed to provide an overview of today's event and that Kevin McNulty will be sharing his expertise with you. I know them both, and I think you're going to get a lot of value out of it. Um, the need, as Steve has already said, for the legislation, I think, was driven for or by the lessons from the Manchester Arena bomb. Uh, and that's likely to be, therefore, the most significant legislative change to the terrorism risk environment for many decades. One of the founding principles of the consultancy arm of Puri, Puri Solutions, was helping members, their policyholders, and the wider insurance industry to understand, quantify, and manage terrorism risk so as to deploy more capital and thereby relieve the burden on the taxpayer. And this legislation could have implications for all aspects of terrorism risk and enable the furtherance of that cause. So, we at Paul Ree, uh, and the reason we're hosting today is that we want the industry to participate in this consultation and to ensure that their feedback is given and reflected in whatever the final legislation is. And that's why we're hosting this event. As terrorism insurance experts, and on the basis of that, our sole focus, Paul Ree will act as the facilitator and conduit between Her Majesty's government and the insurance industry. And although our role in reinsurance terms will remain as a provider of property terrorism reinsurance, we will help the wider market, especially the liability insurance market, to understand the implications and the potential options for managing the new duties that the legislation may impose and which will have ramifications for the industry. In closing, we stand ready to work with our government partners as well as the insurance industry to help manage the implementation of the new duties. And in that regard, I hope that this event is useful for you and interesting. Thank you for attending and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Julian. Uh, um, so I'd now like to hand over to um, Sean Hipgrave, who's the Director of Protect and Prepare at the, uh, at the Home Office. Uh, Sean. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd try and put some context before um, Kevin goes into explaining in, in a bit more detail uh, about the Protect duty and, and the consultation. So uh, Julian very helpfully uh, talked about the need um, uh, for a protect duty and, and this is a manifesto commitment from this government since 2019 um, and many of you may have heard some of the lobbying 
from uh, Fegan Murray, who's one of the mothers of the victims of the Manchester Arena bombing. And, and that's always in the news at the moment because that, that's an inquiry that's been sitting for oh, since last year and will sit for the remainder of this year. But also, you know, in terrorist news at the moment, we've, we've got uh, inquests going on from um, London Bridge as well, uh, from, um, uh, yeah, from the bridge. And then also we've got um, further inquests coming up for attacks that happened in, in 2019 as well. So um, terrorism is a real um, threat. It's something that this government um, considers a, a priority. Um, and even at a time when we are uh, going through COVID and there's a significant economic, economic impact on the country, the government still see it as a priority to keep uh, the public safe from high harms terrorism. Um, I'm, I'm the director of Prote Protect and Prepare and the SRO for Protect in the UK. And I was in an organization called the Office of Security Counterterrorism in the Home Office. It's just interesting to know that we, we've restructured in the Home Office. We've now become Homeland Security. And whilst we still have the terrorist brief in Homeland Security, we now taken in Economic Crime Directorate and Cybercrime Policy as well. So actually both areas that, that are relevant to um, you as uh, a, a sector. Um, this piece of work around the consultation, we've done some pre-consultation engagements or we've already engaged with local authorities, cross government departments, because it will impact all of those. But also since the consultation launched, we've engaged with uh, many sectors of business. So we've live events, theatres, um, live venues, uh, festivals, uh, theme parks, football and sports grounds. Um, we're doing this today with yourself in, in the finance and insurance sector. We've got further engagement like this with retail, transport, faith sector as well. So it, so it impacts almost everybody in the UK. And it's really important that we have as many submissions to the uh, protect consultation from your perspective as possible. Um, just just a, a, a bit bit of admin that we're learning with this consultation if you are going to go into the consultation and and put a response in please press submit at the end we're having so many uh, um, uh, submissions that aren't closed off so you don't have to fill out the whole consultation but you do have to submit it to make sure it does get included in the consultation but it is going to be far-reaching and will have a huge impact and many of your customers and clients uh, will be owners or operators of venues or locations that that will be subject to this legislation. But just so you can hear a little bit more detail on it, um, I've got Kevin who's going to give you a presentation on some of the details and the kind of areas it covers and, and what we're looking for in the consultation. So thank you. Kevin. Thank you, Sean. So as uh, Sean says, uh, I'm a policy advisor in the Public Accessible Locations team within the Home Office, and we are leading on the Protect Duty consultation for government, as well as wider policy that applies at public accessible locations. So uh, Julian and Sean set the scene a little bit. This was a, a manifesto commitment from the Conservative government back in 2019, before they came into power. And the precise commitment was to improve the safety and security of public venues. And as Julian and Sean have referred, the context of this is very much the, the attacks we've, we've seen in the UK since 2017 and indeed in other locations prior to 2017. And whilst we have a, a good system in place to advise organisations with regards to terrorism threats and mitigations, actually what gets done in practice is undertaken on a voluntary basis. And as we've seen uh, a change in the threat profile and the number of attacks in the UK and elsewhere, government has been considering whether that's the right position going forward and whether in the future we need to have a legislative requirement which binds organisations to consider terrorism threats and mitigations to those threats. So as been said, the consultation was launched on the 26th of February. Um, we did plan to launch it in 2020, 
but actually uh, COVID um, deferred those, those efforts at that time. It's an 18 week consultation, and that's longer than the usual period of government consultations, which are usually 12 weeks. Uh, the reason for that is we recognise that organisations have been uh, struggling with the impacts of COVID. As we move into uh, hopefully potentially more normal operation for many organisations and businesses, we hope that by extending the consultation, that will give them more time to return to business as usual and actually uh, be able to undertake uh, this consultation and responses to it. It's a UK wide consultation and indeed uh, legislation which we intend to follow it would be UK wide. That's because national security and combating terrorism is, is what's called a reserve matter within the UK. So it's the competence of the Westminster government. Having said that, the impacts of the duty would be uh, felt within all of the devolved administrations. And when we think about potential delivery mechanisms, for example, how we might undertake inspection, those will be issues which would impact upon the competencies of the devolved administrations governments. So this is an issue that we're working closely with all the devolved administrations governments on. Could I have the next slide, please? So there's four themes in the consultation document, for those of you who've seen it, and if you haven't, we'd urge you to look at this afterwards. The first is uh, who would a duty apply to? The second is what requirements it would make on those within the scope. The third is what the government would have to do to support those who would be impacted by a duty. And the fourth is how we undertake compliance with the duty. Could I have the next slide, please? So the first theme of the consultation is who a duty would apply to. And we've got two firm criteria and thresholds in relation to this, one which is a bit more discursive. So let me, let me outline those in a bit of detail. The first criteria is for the owners and operators of public venues. And that's where they have 100 person capacity or more. And the second is for organizations who operate in publicly accessible locations. And here we have a threshold for large organizations, that's 250 staff or more. Just let me outline the rationale for the, um, the inclusion of large organisations here. So if we take uh, venues with a capacity of 100 persons or more, you may be an organisation and you may have uh, you know, one or several premises which has a capacity of 100 persons or more, but you may operate a number of smaller premises as well. So it would be strange to uh, have a legislative requirement for uh, those large premises, but not to think about what was done at the other premises you have within your operation. Equally, you may be in a large organisation and have a number of small premises below 100 persons capacity. So what we, we, our rationale is that when, you, when you're a large organisation in a publicly accessible location with those 250 staff, you have some resources and you have some competence to think about security. In the same way, you might think about health and safety and you might think about fire safety. The consultation is an opportunity to think about whether these are the right criteria and whether they're the right thresholds. Um, we did go through a bit of an exercise of considering a range of criteria and thresholds, and we think these are perhaps the best ones, but we welcome views on, on that, that view and whether there's other, um, other criteria and other thresholds that we could be considering. The third aspect, um, the third bullet, is about public spaces. And as has been referred, where, where we've seen the attacks since 2017, they've been on our bridges, in squares, in parks and on roads. And as you'll recognise, none of those are actually uh, public venues, um, large buildings, large temporary events with boundaries around them. So many of the inquests and the inquiries which have taken place since 2017 have urged the government to define the responsibility for those who operate some such locations. I think it's fair to say and reasonable that when we're talking about public spaces, they're different to permanent buildings and temporary events because you've got boundaries around them. So when we have a public space, you have less control of that public space if you own or operate it. You don't have the same revenue generation opportunities and you probably don't have staff permanently based at such locations. So security ambitions at spaces, I think, are different to, to other locations. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything we can't do there. So um, when we think about preparedness aspects of uh, security, um, making sure your staff are aware of what constitutes hostile reconnaissance, having an emergency preparedness plan in place which incorporates terrorism threats, and actually making sure that your staff are, are competent, know what's in that plan and regularly exercise it, could all be aspects which would be stressed at public spaces, um, perhaps more than presented security measures. There's also consideration of partnership working with all this as well. So whilst we can place legislative requirements on organisations, 
and on venues, um, many security measures actually require organisations to work together. So, for example, if you think about security controls, um, very often they'll be best undertaken jointly across spaces with different organisations in concert with each other. So actually, um, there's an issue around how we achieve reasonable mitigations by organisations working together in partnership. And there's a question there as to whether that's a matter for legislation or for guidance, which would likely accompany legislation. And that's an ongoing consideration for us as well. Could I have the next slide, please? So the next theme of the consultation is what would a duty require stakeholders to do? And broadly within the consultation, we've outlined three requirements. We'd ask organisations in scope to consider terrorism threats and within that different attack methodologies. We'd ask them to assess the impact of those at the venues they operate. And we'd ask them to consider and take forward reasonably practicable and appropriate protective security and organisational preparedness measures. I think the closest parallel with what we're looking at here is, is a regime which is analogous with the Health and Safety um, a Work Act. That's been very clear in, in talking about outcomes which are achieved, but actually leaves uh, organisations within scope multiple means to get there. So when we look at the scope of a potential protect duty, there's obviously a wide range and number of organisations and venues potentially within scope. And the nature of those businesses and organisations would differ in terms of their size, in terms of their staffing complement, and indeed in terms of the security expertise of that staffing complement, which may be very well developed and sophisticated, but in fact may um, be, be very little, or in fact for some organisations, they may have no security staff at all. The reasonably practical component is an attractive one for us in this context. Um, it's, it's widely used in terms of fire safety and health and safety regulation. And the judgments that organisations undertake will be familiar for many, albeit not always in a security context. When we look at the requirements, there'll be a balance between what we specify on the face of legislation, but also what we detail in the company guidance. And our thoughts at this stage are that the majority of specific details, for example, around the range of mitigation measures and good practice would be specified in that accompanying guidance. If you look at the consultation document, Annex 2 to that consultation document has got um, examples of mitigating measures for a range of different types and sizes of organisations. And when we look at what's required, um, I know our ministers will be very keen to address for those at the lower ends of the thresholds, but simple measures will be, will be key in actually um, being the requirements for them to take forward. When we look at spaces um, more generally, um, we have to think about mechanisms to enable effective working, and that will be particularly important, I think, where we're looking at partnership working. I think if we made a requirement on a range of organisations and venues and then set them off to, to achieve that, I think that would be quite hard to do without some, some means of support and a mechanism to achieve. So that's something we're looking at in conjunction as part of our discussions with stakeholders through these engagement events. This really does link on to the next themes of the consultation. So if I could have the next slide, please. So the next aspect is what government would do to support those affected by duty. And the first requirement of that is, is around that guidance. We'd have to stand up really significant advice and guidance to organisations within the scope. And the sorts of things that would cover would be um, the inclusion of, of terrorism and threats, different attack methodologies, examples of risk assessment and what constitutes that range of reasonably practicable mitigating measures and as well as outlining security processes and systems that organisations uh, should be considering undertaking. We think it's key that this builds on the existing mechanisms which are in place so there's a lot of good advice and guidance which already exists from Cancer Terrorism Policing, the National Cancer Terrorism Security Office and the Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure. Increasingly, those organisations are also putting tools into the public domain. So you may have seen some of the Action Counters Terrorism products. Um, there's an e-learning module which is out there for organisations. And there's also an Action Counters Terrorism app that you can download and your staff can use. So all these are, are increasing the ability to have that information to hand for organisations and their staff. They also undertake a, a variety of uh, in-person awareness and training, albeit that's been lesser during COVID. I think the point here is that much already exists and we want to build on these existing mechanisms and processes and tools 
to outline the range of measures that organisations could consider undertaking. As I say, I think simplicity and proportionality will be the key, in particular for many organisations at the lower end of the scale. We want these requirements to be easy to understand and to implement for organisations. Um, I think we, we're looking at the sectoral guidance that the Health and Safety Executive have established and also guidance for different sizes of organisations. So actually the products we have are appropriate for organisations within scope, but recognising that those audiences have a variety of, of different needs and requirements. Also, when we talk about partnership, I think um, actually having a partnership arrangement might entail some broader support on the ground. So there might be some resource. Um, how that would work um, is, is a matter for ongoing discussion and consideration. But I think we recognise the need for perhaps some on-ground support with regards to some of those aspects and making them work effectively. Could I be next slide, please? So the fourth component of the um, consultation on the duty is around inspection and enforcement. So if we have uh, a duty, we need to consider compliance by those organisations within scope. Now, the primary aim for um, a duty is, is actually not to hit people over the head with a big stick, but actually it's to advise those organisations on security systems and processes and cultures, uh, to raise awareness around security and to provide education to those organisations. However, if there is repeated non-compliance or a failure to comply, we will be looking to have uh, measures in place, punitive measures in place. And we envisage at the moment that will be based around sanctions, fines, rather than imprisonment of individuals. I think there's, there's a question with, with regards to whether there's a need for escalation procedures beyond that, and whether other legislative measures which exist elsewhere are appropriate for that, or whether we might need other, other means. But as I say, at the moment, our primary means of uh, compliance will be around uh, sanctions and fines. We are considering the nature of an inspector of the function. And here we've got two potential options. We could look to an existing inspection function within government, which delivers a similar function and similar requirements, and look for them to deliver that requirement. Or we could develop a, a new arms length body um, within government. And at the moment, we're considering those options and thinking about uh, leading to uh, putting those provisions through in legislation, but equally standing up that inspectorate to deliver this um, as and when legislation is in place. That'd be next slide, please. So the key issues for us at this point in time are um, around the scope of the criteria and the thresholds and getting those right. So they can be easily understood that there's a certainty of scope and there's no ambiguities or unintended consequences. We've been considering the public spaces element with a number of interested groups. Um, we've had some discussions with local authorities, we've had some discussions with our police colleagues, and we've got some discussions lined up with uh, different private sector owners and operators to understand how that concept works from their perspective and to think how it might work in legislation and on the ground. The third aspect for us at the moment is thinking about how those legislative arrangements would translate to working practices on the ground and thinking about how they could be most effective to realise effective security outcomes. And then that leads to the last two bullets, which are sort of planning work at the moment. One is around guidance, having uh, appropriate expertise who can write and develop that guidance. Not that we started it yet, but we're thinking about plans for that and what those requirements would look like for different organisations. And then the last aspect is around planning for that inspection and enforcement capability, um, thinking about the resources for it and thinking about how it would be delivered. Uh, could that be last slide, please? Uh, so the ask for you today are sort of threefold, really. Um, firstly, we, we'd love you to engage in the protect duty. As Sean says, you don't have to answer all the questions. There are 50 odd questions there. Um, but you can answer as many questions as you want, and some will be more pertinent to you and your organisations and others, I suspect. Um, we'd like you to promote that within your networks and through relevant associations. Um, we are doing lots of engagement events. We've done lots of communications, including through social media already, and we continue to do that. Um, but we'd like this to reach as, as far and as wide as possible um, to organisations within scope or organisations who have a relevant interest. And we can only do that through utilising some of those wider networks that you'll have awareness of, that we won't have awareness of. 
And the third ask is a bit of a silent ask there is, is around discussion on days such as this that you sort of make us aware of perspectives and nuances that we might not otherwise know. And therefore, um, we're, we're better advised and we can develop better legislation as a result of that. For our parts, we're going to continue these stakeholder engagement events throughout the consultation period. And we've got a, a good way um, of those to go. We've started to analyse the consultation responses to pick up themes. Um, but the benefit of events is, such as this is we can get um, you know, that one-on-one -on -one engagement from stakeholders and hear about this from uh, people in the know. So they're, they're really vital from that perspective. In terms of next steps from us, um, we'll be considering the responses uh, to the consultation and then we'll be putting forward proposals to ministers to consider taking forward legislation. And you know, the timetable for that will be uh, become clear in due course. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that's my 15 minutes, more or less, and uh, look forward to the discussion and the questions to come. Thanks, uh, Kevin, for that. Uh, um... Uh, I think we've already got some questions co coming through, we, which we'll deal with um, once I've said a few a few words. But please submit your questions through the chat function, uh, and we'll we'll deal with them in a few 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 minutes. Um, I just want to say a few words just to build on what uh, Kevin and Sean have said around the in insurance implications uh, uh, of this. And clearly, there are two broad uh, um, considerations. One is within the property terrorism uh, space that the, the Puri uh, in, in in habits. Uh, and you know that th this uh, new duty is, is quite welcome from our perspective because it, it, it is going to introduce the need to properly assess terrorism risk for many businesses that don't currently do that. And, and we estimate that you know of the you know five plus million businesses in the UK at the moment, very few of them will give specific um, focus on terror terrorism risk beyond general security considerations. So for the first time, many of them are going to have to do do that. Um, and whilst the focus is on very much on pe pe people's say safety, clearly many aspects of the risk assessment are going to be common across property and pe pe people. Um, it, it creates the need for a terrorism risk governance framework, which, which again we, we we think is is a good thing, uh, and it provides a platform for in the integration of terrorism into business risk frameworks, which very frequently it, it isn't. Um, from from Puri's perspective, you know, we we already have tools and techniques that we use to uh, help our members and their policyholders to manage, mitigate their terrorism risks, such as the vulnerability self self, self assessment tool, and we're examining uh, um, how we can uh, amend and adapt those tools to make sure they they, they can reflect the, this new legislation. Um, and, and you know, it's also po po possible that, that some of those tools might be used on a wide, wider basis to uh, provide some of the risk assessments that might might be needed. And you know, we'll maintain dialogue with with home office and insurers in that respect as the consultation progresses. Um, and then clearly, there's the questions about dis dis discounts and premiums. You know, once people uh, uh, have done the risk assessment, what does that what does that mean? You know, well, clearly, it's very like health, health and safety. safety. It's going to, if you've got to do it, then you need, you, need, you need to do it and you don't get a discount for doing what you're supposed to do. But obviously, once you've done the risk assessment and you've uh, worked through what needs to be done, then it may well be that, that future terrorism premiums could be triggered, could trigger further discounts for companies that go beyond the, <laughs> the, the norm. <clears throat> um, clear, clearly, from a, <clears throat> a, li li a liability perspective, the, the position is, is slightly different. Uh, um, you know, um, this duty potentially affects both employers' liability and public li uh, liability. And you, you will all know that most employers' liability policies in the UK will have a, an inner limit, uh, uh, a five million limit of indemnity for, uh, for, for terrorism. Um, general liability policies, public li li liability pol policies, many also have it in, in a limit, although some do exclude it complete, completely. So, so this is very apposite for, in terms of what does this mean? Well, clearly, it creates potentially a new duty of care that policyholders are going to need, need to fo follow. Um, <clears throat> and clearly, in the absence of which, uh, uh, it, it's the same as any other duty of care that, that they all, all already face. If they don't um, do what needs to be done, then it can affect a number of issues, not least of which claim the defensibility, um, you know, breach of, breach of the duty of care, makes clear claims much more difficult to uh, defend. <clears throat> and this, depending on the scope of the legislation, this will be no 
are no different, um, but protect will probably create additional responsibility, re responsibilities that many businesses will, will need to formally deal, deal, deal with. And Kevin talked a bit about the enforcement regime, which is clear, still clear, clearly need, need, needs to be worked, uh, worked, uh, worked out. Um, and, you know, we'll be very interested in, in what that lo looks like, uh, um, uh, as I'm sure insurers will be. Um, you know, we obviously be interested in the, the risk assessment regime, you know, if, 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 if it's about fines and penalties, but how does that interact with existing health and safety, um, you know, employ employees already have a responsibility to maintain a safe place of work for other employees. And if they fail to do that, then there are already penalties and sanctions within health and safety work. So it'd be interesting to see how this interacts with, uh, uh, with that. Uh, and I think there are some quite interesting, <clears throat> once you get into some of the quite complex public environments of spaces that are jointly run and owned by public authorities, by private operators, you know, once you get into arenas where you know a concert is being put on within an arena which is owned by a certain person but then there are multiple parties involved in that process of the promoter of the of contractors who set the stuff up people who run the arena themselves so so how liability sits between all those people is 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 still you know we we, we need to see um and clearly, the um, you know six million dollar question is how does this affect pre pre premiums? Uh, at the moment, that that's unclear. Claims frequency is clearly going to be very very low, so th th there's going to be very little da data for us to establish what what this means. But again, that's something that we we, we need to work through. You know, as I said, Paul 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 Re, you know, we we have no formal role within uh, li li liability, but we have a role within terrorism um, thought leadership. And risk awareness that, that we we see as part of our mission to help our members understand the, the terrorism risk environment more broadly and that's why we're involved in in this uh, um, in it, initiative and we've been maintaining dialogue with both home office and the insurance industry throughout this concentration process and at the end of it and, and helping to the, to the extent that, uh, that we can so, so, so that's all. All I was going to say. Uh, um, so, what what I'll do now is I'll um, work through some of the um, quite uh, questions, um, which uh, um, I'll just go go, go to uh, the first, 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 first one from um, uh, from Jessica Riley, RSA, uh, um, who asks where where do schools and colleges and university fee feature? Uh, they're not public venues as such, but are open and have people moving in and out regularly. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, thanks, Steve. I, I've been looking at a few of the questions as well. So, so probably, uh, and it may answer a few of the questions, uh, you'll notice at the beginning of the presentation um, that the policy area that covers this is called the publicly accessible locations. And you'll notice that we no longer called it crowded places because it didn't cover the areas that we were interested in on whether the, the public have access so so we have defined that as space sectors groups and locations um and i think actually you just talked about spaces and those areas that that are considered in the world as the gray zone where you know and you talked about an arena as a good example where there's a boundary for the arena but people who queue to get into that are obviously uh part of the the arena's um, activity, but they're not actually in the arena space or in a space outside called the grey area. And the responsibility and accountability for that um, rests, may rest with somebody else. But the duty will look to try and resolve um, those responsibilities and accountabilities and will make it a requirement that those owners or operators engage with each other to uh, agree accountability for those create spaces but but we've got um groups so in in that there are faith groups does do do uh churches and faith groups come in into play yes they do because it is a publicly accessible location that may be more than 100 depending on what the scope is um and the public do have access to it so they are within the the legislation that that's the scope at the moment and um and the education sector is it publicly accessible most education sectors are only um accessible to those students who are on there 
but it but it is a, it, it's an area that will be challenging so you know my kids are at primary school so no it's not a publicly accessible location when it's locked up but it maybe is at pickup time if we have access to to that location um universities they're all around cities and different campuses and very often is publicly accessible so so ticketed venues are publicly accessible but places that aren't access to the public like primary schools wouldn't be in, within the scope um so um and, and then the final area um are sectors so spaces sectors groups location sectors are retail sectors is a good example where you have a big retail park and 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 you know supermarkets um where the public have access and they would probably fall within the legislation depending on the size of the organization so generally and there's a lot of questions asking will this be applicable will that be applicable if it's within the scope the numbers we talked about uh, uh, and it's a space sector or group or location where the public have access it will probably be applicable um and, and i think uh, in kevin's example where it's an organization with more than 250 employees you know large retail coffee shops you know will have more than 200 some of the bigger chains have more than 250 employees but never at one time will there be more than 100 people in that coffee shop that would fit within the scope of the uh, legislation as it's consulted at the moment and, and we're still asking for for that scope um could, could i just just steve just jump in ahead because i did have a look at some of those things and i'll put kevin on on notice to come in quite a few people are asking about the uh, threat and mitigation or the risk um um assessment and, and how will we be providing advice on that will ctsa's and NACTO be involved um well, well the answer is absolutely yes uh NACTO, uh, and we'll be using one information sharing platform one single comms platform as the front door to NACTO and cpni and other resources and they'll be involved to provide advice and guidance as they already do um but um we will be making the platform as user friendly as possible so it will be able to have a template for those smaller organizations around what a risk assessment should be and what kind of mitigations um, are the guidance would provide and within the consultation document itself um, it provides some of those types of advice here's the size of an organization this is the risk um, kind of thing we're thinking about here, the mitigations we think about. And I don't know if Kevin, if you just want to sort of provide a couple of examples that we've that we've put in the consultation document um, of, of how we're sort of trying to look at risk, stroke, um, impact, stroke, uh, mitigation. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Sean. Just, just to, to add to that, I think as, as Sean said, um, I talked about health and safety parallels. So I think what we'll be looking at is to provide examples of risk assessment, but not to say to people, here's a template, if you fill this in, you'll fulfill the duty, because there's quite a wide scope to the duty. And I don't think we'll be looking to provide one process to be followed by all organisations, because it would be, be rather presumptuous for us to understand the differing circumstances of the range of organisations in scope. So, so I think it's similar to health and safety, we'll be looking to provide advice regarding assessment processes and indeed mitigations, but not to say, here's something you must do, and if you do it, you will therefore have, have met the requirement. Um, as, as Sean's asked me just to look at some of the um, examples from the, uh, the consultation, I'll just take you through the, the first of those. So this is an example of a, a small business, uh, perhaps a retail outlet um, with a small number of staff, perhaps 10 staff, but actually it could have uh, 100 customers at a time, and it's a public venue, so it's therefore within the scope. So we'd ask that organization to undertake a recorded risk assessment with regards to terrorism threats and different attack methodologies. We'd ask the staff to know how to spot and report uh, suspicious activity so they could use some of the Action Counters Terrorism uh, e-learning products, for example, which are out there. And we'd ask them to think about coordinating their security measures with other businesses in the area. Um, we'd look for uh, not no physical security measures as such, but where there are existing measures for crime prevention purposes, such as 
uh, shutters and locks on doors. We'd want their staff to know how they were included in their security plans to respond to those different attack methodologies. So the business would expect it to be have, to have a plan in place for those different attack methodologies because obviously that could vary depending on the nature of, of an attack. The staff would be expected to have been given training in the appropriate response to the risks. Um, we wouldn't ask um, them to have any measures in place to support police interventions as such. So they're, they're the basic measures for a small type of business, um, a small retail outlet of uh, 10 staff, but actually having 100 customers at a time. So that's one example. There are others in Annex 2 to the consultation, so you might want to have a look at those for the types of measures involved. But again, it's not mandating these measures. These are examples of, of good practice. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That, that's, that, thanks, Sean, Kevin, for that, that additional insight. There, there, there's a couple of questions that particularly struck, struck me uh, one from Christy of SCORE, which is, is there an attention to ensure there is a named responsible person within owners operators companies for these duties assessments to help ensure adoption in, as there is for health and safety? And then Peter Lavery from Cushman and Wakefield asks, will the protect duty define a competent person that gives orders of the security advice for house and delivers and defines sufficient training and experience or knowledge? Can you do with those, Kevin? Yeah, sure. So, so on the on the responsible person, I think what we'll be looking at is for owners and operators. We'll be looking for responsibility to land with the owners and operators of, of a, a venue. Um, whether that requires a named responsible person, I don't think we envisage that on the face of legislation, but I think we need to reflect on that in light of the consultation responses. And um, the competent person, I think, gets into those who have the expertise for, for security. So um, we want the uh, the protect duty to be freestanding as much as possible and for there be enough information in the guidance for organisations to be able to know what to undertake. But we recognise, and this was another question actually to round this one up as well, that litigations will be more complicated for, uh, for larger organisations with more, uh, more outlets, more premises, and perhaps with more members of the public there, so that, that will scale up a little bit. So actually those organisations might want to consider uh, their own staff and their own competence and expertise, or in certain circumstances, they might want to consider um, employing a company who can uh, provide some, some additional expertise. And um, so that's something we're looking at more broadly anyway, with regards to the competence of those organisations who offer uh, security services, and actually uh, thinking about the training available to organisations where they want to develop some of that competence and expertise themselves. So it sort of falls alongside the support and guidance, but, but directly, we're not, we're not necessarily thinking about a named responsible person on the face of legislation. We're looking for owners and um, operators to be responsible, um, but not actually a named responsible person as such. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, um, uh, moving to something uh, a different uh, um, questions from Stuart Toast and uh, uh, Jeff McDonough around uh, compensation. Uh, um, Stuart asks, will victims remain able to claim compensation under the criminal injury compensation uh, scheme, or is the intention to transfer responsibility where there's a breach of duty into the private sector? And Jez asks, in the event of an incident, would liability fall solely, solely on the duty holder, even where other open inverse commas intelligence agencies have potentially contributed to the failure? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting area. We're not, we're not looking to make changes to, to other provisions or, or link to them explicitly. So um, we're, we're envisaging a, a regime of, of sanctions and fines that should be imposed upon the organisations. Um, there is then a read across, um, you know, both in terms of other uh, you know, escalation of, of criminal procedures, which already exist, but equally um, what, what the implications are for, for civil um, regimes. But we're not looking to put any explicit provisions in ourselves, but again, I suppose it's just understanding uh, the implications and, and the consequences from you know, perspectives of, of you and your members, I think, a little bit more. Okay. Um, uh, James Spencer from AIG asks, uh, uh, while the impetus for this legislation appears to have been a mass person venue, some of the most frequently attacked targets are pubs. Those are likely to be below the 100 person threshold. Um, it would seem more sensible to state the standard rather than provide a floor. I mean, that's, that's probably a matter for consultation. We, we chose the thresholds, probably mindful of, of COVID in, on one hand, but it's a bit of a balancing act because uh, these are requirements which will extend, hopefully, when, when COVID has gone, hopefully, if we envisage into the future. So I think it's just having a sensitivity with regards to the impact on organisations. 
Um, and I think consultation is a chance to consider whether those criteria and thresholds are right. So I think it's a, we'll see what we get back in terms of feedback from you know, the range of organisations who might be affected. And um, uh, there's a question from uh, Darren White to MS Amlin, uh, uh, where an entity would ordinarily meet the criteria, but which is itself within a large qualifying area, e.g. a retail shop within a managed shopping centre, where does the primary duty lie? So here what we've, we've been getting many similar questions that a lot of the engagement events we've been undertaking. Um, what we've been doing is, is scoring them down examples of, um, I spoke about having clear criteria and thresholds. Um, we had one about business parks the other day, a very similar one. So we, we've envisaged a public venue to, to be one, one building, one entity, but there'll be examples of premises that don't naturally fall into that. I think our question might be as well sometimes, how is that handled within uh, fire safety legislation, which uh, talks about premises as well? So there'll be established arrangements with regards to that and how that, that retail area, in this case, uh, fulfills its requirements. Um, and is it clear where the responsibility lies there? And actually, I think we're looking at analogous um, scenarios and situations here. So I think we'd, we'd probably look for a reflection on that. But the more examples of um, different premises and different venues that people can throw at us where you know, it might be slightly ambiguous, um, please please do let us know and respond to that question in the consultation on, on that issue. Steve, Steve uh, can I just just coming back to the um, the earlier question around the pub that, oh, you know, that falls below the threshold and and the recent attacks and it's very easy to uh, look at the recent attacks uh, and then try and sort of overlay this protect duty onto that but but remembering that the, the actual um you know what we're trying to do is make the the uk a safer place for the public uh, and we're creating legislation and there will be a balance where we have a threshold and we say that that's within the legislative framework but there will be things that fall below that but it isn't our intention to then um you know our communication is you're in legislation this is this is all focused to you the whole point of having naxo and cpni and a, and, 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 a, and a huge comms campaign and comms platform is is for everybody so so those people who fall below the threshold the advice is still there for them they, they can still take that advice up they it, it may be the, the insurance sector decide that whether you're in the threshold or not, we expect you to, uh, you know, for discount purposes, we expect you to look at the advice and, and show us that you're complying against this terrorist uh, protect advice because it's also very useful for other high harms. So not every attack and not every harm is terrorism, but what we're going to be able to provide through the government and our, and our operational partners is very comprehensive communications, advice and guidance and support to make the UK a, a safer place for all locations where the public have access. Yeah, okay, thank, yeah, thank, thanks, Sean. Uh, um, uh, just a couple of further questions before we uh, finish. Uh, there's one from uh, Amanda Catron from AIG, which is, uh, will there be consideration of the new duty to be built into the design and build of new developments that include public accessible uh, um, spaces? Many multi-occupancy developments are being built that include private housing, but also restaurant and leisure complexes, cinemas and the like, as well as meeting areas and gardens. Yeah, in fact, I had a, a meeting yesterday with the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, their planning representatives. So, so what we're trying to do is anticipate where there's, there's crossovers. So there's a number of mechanisms already which are there for crime prevention and safety purposes, but actually they may be doing helpful things to realise the security outcomes as well. So with regards to planning, um, I think what we envisage is that if, if you're considering a development, we'll want you to make you aware of, of security requirements. Um, so security is already part of the planning regime when we have the national planning policy framework and guidance, and uh, they've been considering and developing new design codes at the moment. They include advice with regards to security. We would want to signpost those developers, planners and architects to the requirements of the protect duty. So they are aware of that when they're, when they're designing uh, their, their new developments and that that's something they can factor into their considerations. Whether there would then be a formal requirement in the planning regime that they would consider security, I, I doubt, but that's um, something we need to tease through with um, those, those different parts of government who operate those processes because we would have to support those processes so they would understand security 
Um, so I think it's that interaction between the processes as well. We'll need to consider a little bit further in a bit more detail. Okay. Um, and uh, probably one final question that, uh, from Chris, Chris Sloan. Uh, will there be powers created for post-event inspections similar to HSE or corporate manslaughter type investigations? So we have had initial discussions, I, I presume when he means post-event inspection, if there were to be an attack somewhere, yeah. and, uh, yeah. you know, there was a need to think about what measures that organisation had put in place. We, we have had initial discussions with the police around whether there's a need to think about that sort of capability and function. No, no firm decisions yet, but it's, it's, it's a good question and it's something we're looking at. Okay. Um, I think we've got through most of the... Uh, um... Quite, 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 uh, quite questions. Uh, um, well, can, I well, touch, can I touch on one, Steve? Sorry, if we've just got yeah, go on. So someone asked about um, when it might be introduced. Um, so uh, obviously we need to uh, you know, consider the consultation responses and then have, have a bill taken forward. I think it was looking around the time uh, limit to be built in. So when we have the bill, um, there'd be an implementation date for the provisions, but we would need to undertake awareness. And in fact, that's one of the other questions there. Um, we would need to make the organisations in scope aware of the requirements for the protect duty um, prior to that implementation. So there'd be a natural lead in time between the bill being passed and then the legislation being implemented. And that would be an opportunity to provide that awareness for organisations in scope and to think about um, you know, some sort of broad uh, awareness linked to our existing outreach mechanisms. Okay, thanks, uh, Kevin. Um, we'll um, we'll we'll take, take we, we're taking images of the fo of the uh, of the questions, and we'll put some dialogue up on our web website around Q Q Q Q and A, and and we'll talk to uh, Home Office to uh, get answers to any questions that we haven't uh, uh, dealt with. Um, so so I guess in, in closing, uh, firstly, thank 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 you all for joining the, this uh, assembly uh, meeting webinar, whatever you call uh, I'll call it. Um, but my uh, my clo closing uh, um, request is that you do participate in the in the consultation. You do complete the uh, go onto the website and 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 complete 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 the questions because uh, this is you know a it's it's pretty important. You know b it involves the so you know say the safety of the public and c you know it is going to involve change, especially to the li liability market, new new duties, new responsibilities, and so. You know, if we don't um, provide Home Office with the uh, feedback and insights to help them shape the legislation appropriately, then we 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 can't moan if we don't like what 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 we end up with in two three years time. So 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 please com com complete the consultation and uh, and then you know we we will continue to uh, maintain dialogue between Home Office and insurers and, and we may well run another uh, session like like this once the uh, the scope of the legislation is is. Uh, is starting to be to be defined to uh, to help Home Office understand uh, what what uh, what the response of the industry might be. So thank thank you all very much for for, for attending and uh, and have have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.